Hello and welcome into the Fog.net podcast. My name is Michael Swain, the Kansas beat writer for 24-7 Sports, and we are coming to you with a Saturday reaction podcast, going to break down KU football's 34-23 to win over Illinois at David Booth, Kansas Memorial Stadium. Of course, I'm joined by Kevin Flaherty, who was also in Lawrence and maybe a little bit different capacity <laughs> than I was. But Kevin, what was your experience like watching the game and how are you feeling on this mid Saturday morning? Yeah, it, it was kind of uh, kind of interesting because uh, I, I was sitting in the alumni section um, and uh, so got to uh, got to experience it from a, from a fan threshold. I thought the atmosphere for the most part was really good for the, for the first half, you know, and and obviously so was, so was Kansas, Mm. you know, second half, a lot of students left and everything. And, uh, and, and, you know, a lot of fans left quite frankly, because I think Kansas had gotten up by so much, but it led to some pretty tense moments that I'm sure we're, we're going to talk about when things started to get really choppy, when Illinois started to come back a little bit and, you know, and it's funny, you know, walking out of the stadium, my, my dad kind of said, you know, the, the mood was, you know, if you, if you look back to where Kansas was a couple of years ago, you know, you'd have fans excited because they just beat an FCS team here, Kansas, you know, beat the spread against a big 10 team one by 11 points. And still the feeling walking out was that it should have been more. What was, uh, what was sort of the, the feeling uh, from, from your angle? Yeah, very similar. You know, it almost had some of the similar vibes to the Duke game last year. Yeah. Where I think that was a game too. Where I think a lot of people left like, wow, okay, you should have won by a lot more. And then yep. it was a, I think that one was actually a one score game. But I think generally you look at how far the programs come yep. and a game like this on national TV against a Big Ten opponent. And like you said, Kevin, you have fans leaving early because it's it's at, it's out of hand. Yeah. For KU, this isn't Illinois coming in and, and smoking KU. This is KU dominating what is probably going to go on to be a bowl team in the Big Ten. And so I think overall, I mean, I just generally, I was impressed by every single aspect of the game. Yeah. The student section was awesome. Yeah. That might have been the best student section I've seen in the last five, six years. I, I love the blackout from, um, from yeah. a fan standpoint. And I mean, and I've been in stadiums where they've done like a blackout or a whiteout or a blue out or whatever, but I kind of liked it just being the student section because you yeah. could tell how big of a student crowd was there. That was one of the better student sections I can remember. Yeah. Well, I'm They were probably also in a different type of blackout as well. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and then I love the student section. So you look at the section, right? It's kind of like a big rectangle. Well, then there's like a part, if you're watching from the TV perspective, there's like a part to the left where the band's at. And you're right. Like the black shows you who's in the student section. And then there was like students behind the band where usually it's kind of more empty. Like maybe there's some regular fans and there was just a lot of students there. And look, there's always going to be students that leave at halftime. That's just how it's going to be, right? It's going to be people at the top, right? The people at the bottom are the ones that get there early. They're dedicated. They're there for it. But just the student crowd was awesome. And I guess we probably could just talk about the attendance to start off before we actually dive into the actual game. Um, The announced crowd was 45,800. It was not that. Obviously, I think a lot of people have issues with traffic. I saw some terrible photos of people taking K-10 and things are going down to one lane and it backs up. I take K-10 and thankfully from my perspective, I leave early enough where it doesn't really matter. But even when I'm leaving at 233 for this game that's at 630 there's still a backup where it's pretty slow so it's just a bummer that this is all happening right now and when there's a big friday game but i thought the crowd the people that were there made a lot of noise i think illinois had some uh pre-snap penalties not a ton but a couple over the course of the game and i thought that crowd was great you know and i think byu now right R- real chance that that one's going to be a sellout parents weekend um, KU you know, will be three and zero unless there's a total disaster class in Reno next week. So I think overall you're looking at this being a very similar start to like last year, right? Where you know solid crowd for the opener, then all of a sudden the sellout started to roll in. I think we're probably trending somewhere close to that. Yeah, I would agree with that, and, and I think too, you know, I, I'm not trying to 
to blame the student section because they turned up and everything. I do think when you when you go to a football game as a fan, you almost have to treat it like you're fighting Jason in Halloween, right? Like, yeah, he just fell down four stories. It seems like the game's over. Like, there's no way he survived that fall all the way down there. There's no way Illinois could come back. And yet you're there in the fourth quarter and it's tense and, you know, Illinois has the ball with a chance to make it a one-score game and a significant portion of your fans aren't there. You know, like you said, there are going to be some students that leave, I, I guess, you know, and, and maybe this is kind of an old fogey take on it a little bit. You know, I, I would kind of rather they stay until, you know, you look down and you poke Jason's body and make sure that, that he's not getting up again or what or whatever before uh before you leave and, and i that did leave uh that did leave for some some tense stuff because illinois did have the ball it was getting close at the end it was getting tense and a significant portion of the fans that turned up weren't weren't there for that and they weren't there to to impact the game the way that they did in the first half and i think you put it really well they did impact the game in the first half and, and so um, I, I thought it was a, a great turnout, um, especially Friday night. And, you know, you, you made the point, in, not on the podcast, but in a conversation that, that we had, um, a lot of people don't love the Friday night games because it's harder to get to as a fan. It's harder to have full yeah. attendance. It's harder to sell out. But the flip side of that is if you throw the game on a random Saturday – at 2.30, where you've got three or four other games competing in your window, how many fans, how many people are outside of KU fans are going to watch that game or outside of KU and Illinois fans? Whereas last night, you're kind of in your own window. You have mm -hmm. national people talking about uh, KU and, and Illinois. You have people talking about how good Kansas looks, how good the offense looks. And so the attendance wasn't 47,000. It wasn't a sellout. But you look at the number of eyeballs that were able to see Kansas, and I think it's more than what it would have been if it were a sellout on a random yeah. Saturday. Yeah, and look, I think everything about this game was calculated. Yep. Like the way the broadcast was set up. I've never seen a coach get interviewed after a third quarter. Yeah. This isn't the NBA. Yep. This isn't the NBA, and they interviewed Lance Leipold at the end of the third quarter after they Austin Rivers gets they tossed. Interviewed, they interviewed Travis well, Goff. That's what I'm going to get to. Yep. That's the thing. That's the thing. KU knew what it was doing with this. Like, a lot of people watching this game, Lance Leipold gets interviewed twice. Travis Goff is getting interviewed on the sideline during the middle of the game. Yep. Like, this does not happen if this is a random 6 p.m. kick on FS1, because guess what? FS1 probably puts a remote broadcast there. <laughs> where they don't even have anybody there. You know? I, I think so K-State, uh, you know, we're filming this on Saturday. I think K-State has a remote broadcast today. Because mm -hmm. I, yeah, I think that there's a remote broadcast that has the K-State game, and that same crew has another game that's remote later in the day. So, yeah, yeah. I mean, your, your point there is well taken. And I thought, you know, even – Beyond the broadcast, I thought within the stadium, a lot of the things that they did were really good. You know, when the team comes out in the Blackhawk jerseys, it's to back in black. I don't know, you know, if everybody realized that they come out for the second half, it's to men in black. Then in the third quarter, they showed this giant infomercial for the new uh, the new gateway project in the stadium and, and all of those things. And you know, after the the Kevin Harlan you know hype video and everything finishes up, I am the entire crowd standing up and applauding and everything. It was just it was very well done in terms of them getting the messages across that they wanted to get across. And I, I think we've spent a lot of time not talking football, and so I'll transition into the biggest message that they got across. I think was on the field though, and coming out and smacking Illinois right away the way that they did. Yeah, and I think from the get-go, right, Jalen Daniels looked like Jalen Daniels, and that was something that going into the game I wasn't sure about. Would he have rust like he did against Texas last year, right, where I think the first half was a, a pretty rusty game for him. And I think this has become pretty clear, right, and I think as time goes on, hindsight 2020, right, you understand a lot more than maybe in the moment. Jalen Daniels could have played last week against Missouri State, right? He could have played, but yeah. they held him back, ramped him up, 
and he it's like one of those um you know those toy cars where you kind of have to pull it back yep. and you let it go and it shoots forward sure that's what this felt like for jalen daniels where you know you, you pull him back a little bit you pull him back a little bit just to make sure he's ready to go and then this is the game where boom he goes forward and i think from the get-go he was awesome and then there's the first play from scrimmage too where, where jason bean's out there as well and I think that was Lance Leipold having a little bit of fun with it. Um, but I just, I mean, we can just go through, I guess, just from the start. After the first drive, I think in, in my head, I'm thinking, okay, yeah, KU's going to win this game. Just the way they were attacking Illinois, getting all those guys to move side to side. It, it was just the type of matchup that if Illinois had the recipe to stop it, they would have stopped at the beginning. Right, because that would have been in the game plan that they know they're going to go side to side. They're going to have things for it, but they didn't. And that's exactly what KU did. They just first couple of plays, right, were, were passes, right, just to get out of the box, get guys moving side to side. And then they started to run the ball. And I just thought it was a masterful game plan. And I think pretty early on, it, it felt like, okay, yeah, KU's got things ticking offensively and, and defensively. I mean, they were dominant, but let's just let's talk Jalen Daniels to start. I mean, sure. I, I just. I, I I don't know what to say. Like he's the, so the, good. He's the, so good. The other thing about Jalen Daniels that I was watching, and I'm glad you brought up the Texas game, was in the Texas game, they didn't run Jalen Daniels. You know, mm. he was on the field, but that was not Jalen Daniels. And, and and not just from his perspective, but in terms of they didn't want to run Jalen Daniels. They didn't want to put that shoulder at risk, mm-hmm. right? And so even when you had um handoffs and Jalen was booting off of the handoff against Texas Texas was gambling that hey Jalen's not going to keep this ball Mm -hmm. we're all going to follow the running back nobody's going to need to stay with with Jalen and and I thought you know it was really smart on Texas's part and a big part of that reason that maybe that game got out of hand more than it it would have if you would have seen you know Jalen at full go this wasn't like that you had Jalen running the ball you know, and you had you had Jalen at what I would consider full go, and not just from a throwing standpoint, but from a rushing standpoint, a carrying the ball standpoint, all of those different things too, where it wasn't like they were treating him with kid gloves because of the back. And I thought that was so encouraging. You know, if he would have just dropped back and throwing the ball 40 times in this game or whatever, and they never would have run him, I would have sat here and said, oh, gosh, like maybe the back's still bothering him. Maybe they're still worried about it. They're taking something off the table. And they didn't. They had him running the option. They had him running up the middle in, in some cases. And, and so to see that, I think, was was really encouraging. And, and that's even before you get into you know just how well he actually played. His arm strength has gotten better. Yeah. I think that was abundantly clear. You look at some of the throws he made. I think about the one in the end zone where he avoids two guys and then like off us, he's running to his left and just like slings it, you know, 30 yards or whatever to, to Lawrence Arnold. That was incredible. There's one where he's running to his right and then makes the throw to Luke Grimm. That was incredible. Yeah. I just think there are so many throws here where, yes, I think we saw Jalen Daniels show the arm strength last year. Right. But I just think it looks different right now. It's got so much more velocity coming out of his hand. And being the preseason Big 12 offensive player of the year is big. Living up to that is hard. Sure. And what he showed on Friday night is that he can do that. Right. You look at the numbers, basically 275 passing yards, two touchdowns, one interception. I'm sure we talk about that later. Um, but then on the ground, right, yeah, he was good enough. You know, 24 yards, think about, right, I think the sacks are, are factored into that as well. But he's someone that just shows that that dual threat ability and just the ability to make plays that I don't think every other quarterback in the Big 12 can make, right? You look at the third down scramble, um, I think that would have been in the second quarter maybe where it's third and 10, they're backed up inside their own 20, and he scrambles free for 15 yards and – resets the chains and all of a sudden the offense is moving again. I mean, there were just so many difference making level plays from Jalen Daniels that if he stays healthy, man, like it's going to be some crazy numbers he puts up this year. Yeah. And you, you look at, 
you look at that, you look at the fact that I thought the arm strength showed up too on a lot of the short passes. And what I mean by that is the fact that Kansas got a lot of yards after catch. And a lot of the yards after catch came because the ball got out of his hand quickly and it got to the runner really quickly. You know, you think about even something as simple as that little like flare out that they threw to Devin Neal, you know, mm. to get him on the side, stuff like that. You know, and, and it's not, you know, he's not throwing the ball, you know, 100 miles an hour, but he is getting it on them quickly where they have room and, and space to do different things. The the touchdown ball um, to, uh, to Torrey Lachlan was just beautiful where he threw that, you know, to the backside of him and everything. Um, the, the throw to Jared Casey that was a touchdown was really good. I'm glad mm-hmm. you mentioned the, the throw that he made on uh, – where he avoided uh, Johnny Newton in in the end zone. You know, that's a first round NFL draft pick. That's where people have him tracking. And he had Jalen dead to rights and he kind of crossed him over almost like a basketball player, you know, broke his ankles in in space, got around him. Like you said, rolled off to the, to the left. Of course, anybody who's ever thrown a football knows it's harder to throw if you're right-handed rolling to your left and, Mm -hmm. you know, to be able to uncork a ball 30 yards downfield and absolutely put it on Lawrence Arnold, you know, that, that was a a pretty amazing throw there. And and you look at, you know, how much, uh, I I thought the receiving core played really, really well Mm -hmm. too. Um, and, And it was, it was funny because we were sitting next to somebody who had been at the chiefs game on Thursday night. Yeah. When you had all the drops and everything, and they yeah. just you know kept it, kept uh, you know kind of mentioning like, man, you know, Chiefs could have used this, you know, last night when you've got Luke Grimm going up and mossing people and, and all the different things. And so, I, I thought the receiving core played uh, played really mm-hmm. really well. Um, it, it was uh, it was kind of a shame they did have that touchdown pulled off the board because I, I thought that was kind of a bogus block in the back, but. Yeah, but but generally speaking, you know, Jalen puts up over 300 yards of, of total offense, and, and that's in a game where, he, if you look at it, he spent the last you know half quarter at least, you know, kind of handing the ball off to mm-hmm. to run the clock down. So it was it was a strong performance for your first game, especially against. And I know a lot of people are ripping Illinois' defense. I don't know if Illinois' defense was the problem as much as Kansas had all the answers for Illinois' defense. Yeah, and something that you know I had written about a lot heading into the game, right, was that this is going to come down to which style wins out. And KU style won out because, you know, I don't like basketball analogies in football. Sure. But it's something Bill Self talks a lot about. Speed beats size every time, every time. And that's something the coaching staff has talked a lot about as they've gone to the four guard lineups and everything like that. That's exactly what this game was. KU was too fast on the outside and Illinois couldn't cope with it. And guys were out of position all the time. And look, I mean, think about how many times Jalen Daniels scrambled in the pocket and made those Illinois defensive front seven guys look like you or me, or they get cinder blocks on their feet. The guys look slow. They couldn't turn. It was like turning a freight train around. You know, it's just certain things that KU athletically look so much different. And I think that's – we can talk about physicality later, but I just think the progression of this team athletically is really impressive. Like Devin Neal, some of the cuts he's making right now, I did not see him make last year, even when he was fully sure. healthy. Jalen Daniels looks like Lamar Jackson out there in terms of the ability just to, like, cut and move and shift. Like, again, it just stuff that I don't know if they were showing this level of explosiveness in their change of direction last year. And I just am, I'm so impressed. And I think you look at the running game, and maybe this will segue into physicality talk, but I just think you look at the running game, right? And to have, you know, guys like Neil and Hyshaw basically combined for, you know, over 200 yards of rushing, like that is what that duo did last year when yep. they were so good. And even then for Hyshaw, this is a career high. In yards total, right? I think the stats here show 98. I think total, you know, net rushing yards is 98. I think he rushed four over 100 over the course of the game. That's what the running back tandem looked like. And to do it against this Illinois defensive front, and I think it speaks to the physicality. 
that KU's offensive line played with. I think there were times where Illinois was able to pin their ears back and they won some reps, but I'd say 75% of the game, KU's offensive line was the one imposing their will. And I just, it's one thing, Kevin, for coaching staffs to talk about it, right? How many years have you, have you seen or heard a coaching staff at KU talk about, oh, we want to do this, oh, we want to be this, and just have it not show up? Yeah. Hey, you talk to talk on the physicality. They talked it all off season, even during the week. Hey, this is going to be a big test for us and where we're at. And this is how I measure it, Kevin. Think about all the times Oklahoma came into Lawrence or KU went to go play Oklahoma. And throughout the course of the game, like seven or eight KU players have to be helped off the field. Sure. Did any KU players need to get helped off the field? No. How many Illinois players? <laughs> no, had to I, I don't off? think so. It was kind of funny because a lot of Illinois guys were, were taking knees, as I'm sure you noticed. The, my favorite play maybe from last night was uh, an Illinois guy made a tackle, stood up, flexed, and then like wound up like waiting a second or two and then dropped down to a knee to get medical attention. So I mean they they were they were definitely uh, trying to create some breaks in there and, and things like that, but you know this seems small. The game was mostly over. We have talked on this podcast how many times about the test isn't going to be KU running the ball because KU is going to run the ball pretty well generally speaking. They've got a good scheme, Andy Kotelnicki with the things that he does with motion and things like that. You know, he's going to do a good job of fooling people and opening up gaps for for these running backs and and for Jalen Daniels. Illinois knew KU wanted to run the ball for a first down on KU's final possession. And Kansas lined up and over three yard over three plays, they ran for a first down. Illinois knew KU was running it. KU knew KU was running it. KU said we got to get 10 play 10 yards over these next three plays. And Kansas got those 10 yards. When was the last time that you can remember Kansas not getting that because it was tricky or because it fooled somebody, but just mm-hmm. lining up and saying, Hey, we're we're gonna run the ball and get the first down right now. Exactly. Well, and look, I think you look at the other side of things, right? And I think KU's um, do you have any more thoughts on the offense and then we can do it to defense? Cause no, I've got no, a, that's okay. that, that was good. So I, I think you look at right. The physicality, right. Of the offense and the way that they played. And then the, I wouldn't even say trickery, just the schematic advantage that they created against Illinois. The other side was just pure blunt force. Just we are more physical than you. And for me, the big number, right. I think for so long, in these big games last year, right against the big physical teams, KU was giving up over a you know 150 200 yards rushing, right? Look at this game. You take away Alt Myers' uh, long 73 yard touchdown run, which had bus two bus two linebackers had spies on him on that play, and th- they just decided to go different direction and it created the hole for Alt Myers. But uh, take that away. Illinois had 66 rushing yards. Yeah. All game. You know, that that's where KU won it. They won it because they were more physical on the defensive line. And this is exactly what we talked about last week. They are more athletic. Those guys up there are dominating. Jeremy Robinson had a great game. You look at him getting two sacks. KU as a team got six sacks, the most they've had since 2009. And just the tackle for loss numbers. Like this is a defense that just got after Illinois got after them and dominated and they had no breathing room. And it, I just, you know, this defensive front, you know, we talked about what this could look like later in the season, but this is where the growing pains are supposed to be. And they just did that to Illinois. So, you know, what could this look like towards the end of the season when they've actually guys like Austin Booker have more experience guys like, you know, Tommy DJ and Gage once they've got a lot more time under their belts, like think about it. They just did that in a week too. Just I, I was super impressed with just the defensive front overall and what they're able to do. Yeah, I mean, and you look at you know Illinois' leading rusher was uh, was Luke Altmyer who ran for seventy yards, and he had a seventy-two yard touchdown run on the bus. Mm-hmm. So other than that one carry, Altmyer, who is their leading rusher, ran for negative two yards. 
So, I mean, that, that was, uh, I thought the defensive line was terrific. I thought the front seven was terrific. And, and yeah. you know, it, it's funny because we, we talked about all off season and you, you know, credit to you, you really banged this drum a lot. Jamie Brown, when, it, when he got his chance, you know, sort of, Hey, this, this is a guy that's going to find a way to factor in. Is he going to be a starter? We don't know. Is he going to be very important? Probably yes. You know, and, and you look at this game where you have Taiwan Berryhill out, you know, and, and the impact that J.B. Brown was able to make in different phases, too. I mean, he had the big sack there in the fourth quarter where he lined up just as an edge guy and got home, basically. And, and so you look at the versatility and the athleticism there as well, and, and – uh, I thought it was well put with the with the strength and stuff too. Austin Booker won in week one with his athleticism, and for a guy who's six six and you know kind of rangy, you know that's kind of where you expect him to win. I mean, against Illinois, he won with his strength. He got those arms extended. He got into guys. He was able to break off from blocks and, and you know, chase Altmaier pretty well. And, and so when you when you look at that and, and you know the obviously the the call on, on Booker, you know, I'm sure Kansas will will go ahead and uh, will go ahead and appeal that. Uh, There's no, I'm sure that they're they're appealing it. Yeah, yeah, with uh, with the targeting and everything, but I thought. Booker played with a lot more physicality. I thought the defensive ends played with a lot more physicality. I expected the defensive tackles to be physical, but I'm not sure I expected the defensive ends to be this physical this early. Mm -hmm. And when we talked about the defensive ends heading into the season, what I think I said was, I think the defensive ends are going to be really good next year. And I expected them to kind of take a jump at some point this year. And I didn't know, is that going to be week four? Is that going to be week eight? Is it going to be week six? But I thought at some point they would kind of get to that point where you would exit this season saying, man, that defensive end group is going to be really, really good in 2024. And Swain, from what we saw against Illinois, I'm not saying they're there, but I am saying they're already flashing in that way that you would want them to flash if you're expecting big things from them in the future. Yeah, and I, I think now it's going to be progression, right? So for Austin Booker, right, back-to-back -back games with 15-yard penalties, great. He knows now. And look, I think it's also probably a sign of growth that, you know, last in week one, right, he hits the quarterback kind of in the legs and the knees. Well, yep. where did he hit him this time? right in the target area and yeah. that is a terrible targeting call I'll, I'll get to that in a second but look who are the guys that are standing out in terms of like the newcomers right like it, it's austin booker it's jb brown like if you're a subscriber i told you about this i told you <laughs> these guys were going to dominate right and it's great to see it pan out in person because these guys have more athleticism more length more natural physicality than I think some of the guys were playing in these spots last year. Kevin, Lonnie Phelps last season had four sacks in 11 games against Power 5 teams. Austin Booker now has two sacks in one game against Power 5 team. Yep. Jamie Robinson, two sacks in a game against Power 5 team. You know, they're replacing the production that Lonnie had. And you could even argue the production that Lonnie had wasn't great over the course of the season once you factor out dominating a terrible Tennessee Tech team. So I, I just look at the defensive ends, and what was your big question? Well, how are they going to rush the passer? Well, Jamie Robinson's done it. Austin Booker's done it. Dylan Brooks and his limited snaps is doing it. Patrick yeah. Joyner is out there, and I think he's doing a really good job. And then the defensive tackles. Like, this defensive line athletically looks great, but it, it just it's producing. And I think that was going to be the big question was the talents there. What's that production look like? And, and they're producing. So um, as for the targeting call, what'd you think about it for, for Booker? And we can talk about Kobe's in a minute, but what do sure. you think about Austin Booker's targeting call? Yeah. I, I thought I saw some people freeze the frame right before the tackle where Booker's head was kind of down or whatever. 
but I thought on contact, the helmet went to the side. It didn't, you know, he didn't spear him with it. And so to me, you know, it, it seemed like, uh, it seemed like a bad call. I mean, obviously he didn't hit him high. He didn't hit him low. He hit him exactly where you're supposed to hit him. It wasn't a quote unquote defenseless player thing. Cause he was still throwing the ball, you know, and when he, when he came in to make that contact it, and so, I, I thought that one was off. Uh, like you said, I, I know we're going to get into to Kobe's deal, but uh, but but I thought Booker's was the the questionable one uh, of those two. Yeah, I agree. So they are gonna try and get both overruled. This is a Big Ten crew, so it's probably a little bit different process. Where if this was a Big Twelve crew, it'd be very simple. Like, okay, you would know how to do it. But um, they are gonna appeal it we'll see what happens. I don't know if like, you know, if the appeal will go through, but I'd say the Austin bookers is, as like, what do you want him to do there? Yeah. Like, what do you want him to do? Like he didn't hit him low. He didn't hit him high. He hit him with the shoulder pad. If you look at where the impact happens, like he hit him hard. Yeah. It's football, right? Like it's football. And I think the, for me, the, the, the part that is so, I just can't under I can't I can't understand it, but it's so stupid. Is the fly got thrown after Luke Altmaier laid on the floor for a minute? He gets up, and then they're like, "Oh yeah, now we're going to check this for targeting." After Brett Bielma chewed out the referees for a minute, you know, it's like, look, if you're going to f- call targeting here, throw the freaking flag when it hit happens. Like, don't play the whole oh well, you know, we didn't see it in real time, so let's go review it now. Like, what are we doing here, right? Either it looks like it in real time or it's not. You don't need to play the results on something like this. So I just thought it was silly. Now, Kobe's, that was targeting. Like <laughs> yeah, that yeah. Was, that, and, that was and, like and, expert. And I, I will say it's a little unfortunate given that, you know, the guy's ducking down. I mean, it, I, I, I 100% get that. I was I was once a very bad football player myself. I know <laughs> it's, I know it, it's a bang, I know it's a bang, bang play. And I know that, when you're trying to hit a guy in the midsection and he's ducking down, you know, you're, you're hitting where the waist should be. And instead the head's there. I get that. Um, Kobe still launched. Kobe still got head. Kobe still, <laughs> I shouldn't say it that Kobe still got the guy's head. You know, we mm-hmm. were not trying to make this, uh, not trying to make this bad for, for kids to listen along, but you know, it, it's, it's interesting overall, I think to, defensively i thought the secondary played a terrific game i i really did um i thought kansas looked really athletic on defense and the thing that i i take away from this game that's different from last year i think kansas is well coached defensively in terms of knowing what they're doing and, and we don't give um i i'm somebody i'll, I'll criticize brian borland sometimes because i don't know that kansas is being complex enough or, or whatever else kansas had a very good handle on what illinois was was doing and was trying to accomplish last year it seemed like borland would get the guy in place the guy would miss a tackle and a big play would happen right yesterday the guy was in place and a lot of times he still didn't make the tackle but his buddies were there. The That's second the guy made the tackle. The third guy made the tackle. They they gang tackled and they had a lot of guys in position. The the only complaint I would have had about Borland yesterday was the fourth and long where they played prevent and kind of gave up the easy completion over the middle late and that's, you know, that's one play out of how many. Other other than that, I thought, you know, this was as well coached a Kansas defense as, as I've seen in a while. And, and I thought, like I said, I, I thought that they had a very real idea of, Hey, this is what Illinois wants to do offensively. And there were very few things that Illinois did that ever put Kansas in a spot where it fooled Kansas, where they didn't know what was going on. And, and so I, I thought, Andy Kotelnicki was was in his bag. I'm sure you, you could find a, a player too, especially a, a third and short, where maybe they got a, a little cute in terms of what they were doing, where maybe they could have done things a, a little differently. But again, 
nitpicking over the course of the game. I, I thought Kotelnicki and Borland were both terrific, and those were those were kind of masterful games from both guys. Yeah, I totally agree. You know, I think the coaching you can really see it defensively, yeah. where you just see how the whole piece of the puzzle comes together, and how important that defensive line is. Right. Yep. And I keep coming back to it because that like, what's the common denominator here? The back sevens all the same, really outside of your backup linebackers. What's yep. changed the defensive front and those guys yep. are getting up field and they're changing games. And so I think you look at just overall, this fits now, right? The whole piece, all the pieces, right? The defensive line gets penetration. The running backs have to play in a crowded backfield that allows the athletes like JB Brown, you know, when Taiwan is healthy, Taiwan, even Rich Miller to get in the mix, right? And I think that's exactly what this defense is going to be, where Marvin Grant now can really flash because he's able to come up and make plays. I think this is the type of defense where now Kenny Logan can come in and play to his skill set, where he's yeah. not having to take long angles to, you know, with his athleticism, right? Like that's when it's not great for Kenny, I feel like. When he has a target, he can go and tackle and hit. I think that's when he's really good. And so I look at this and I say the defense, the way it's coaching and the way that I think they really funnel things to areas of the field where they can get multiple hats on the ball. Yep. Right. How many times last year did we see, you know, Mello or Kobe or, or, or Taiwan or Mc, Lorenzo McCaskill try and tackle a guy in space and whiff. Yep. Well, now if a guy, you don't have to go make that play. You can just stand the, the offensive player up and you know, you got one or two guys coming behind you to tackle them. Like, I think that is really helping this defense play at such a higher level and play faster than I think they did last year. So I think, look, Illinois is not a good offensive team. I think they're yeah. kind of meh. I think Luke Altmaier is a good quarterback. I think Luke Altmaier could start for several big 12 teams, but I just look at the rest of the offense and what they do, the skill guys, it's not great, but I just think the way that KU dealt with the way that Illinois wanted to be the more physical team, the way they dealt with that, I think is really, really encouraging, especially when you look at BYU in two weeks. That's exactly what BYU is going to be, a physical team that tries out physical you. Well, KU should be able to match that now just based on what we saw yesterday. So yeah. I think overall, like in terms of like complete performances, right, that first half was – I put this on Twitter, Kevin. I'll ask you. That first half – Best half of football since when? Ooh. Most complete offense, defense, special teams. Yeah. I mean, you, you'd have to go back probably, and this is entirely off the top of my head, so I'm sure somebody's going to show up in the comments and be like, oh, you forgot this one game or whatever. Given the caliber of competition as well, I would say 2008 K-State maybe, where mm -hmm. that game, you know, Kansas could have put a hundred burger up on K State that day, and, uh, and and especially the way that that they just took off in that one. And so that's the one off the top of my head where I'm thinking, okay, that's given the the quality of competition mm -hmm. and everything, that's the one that jumps out to me. Maybe I mean they weren't Boston. a great they, they weren't a great team, but um, Texas a few years ago in Austin when they jumped out to the big lead against Texas and Austin, but even then. I felt like it was more Texas having a bad half as opposed to Kansas coming out and really sort of wrestling the thing uh, away from them. But I would say 08 K State off the top of my head. I thought Boston College 2019. Yeah. When they just came out, like Boston College wasn't a good team, like they weren't great, but they were still halfway decent and KU blitzed them. Like that was one that came to my mind. Um, but yeah, I, easily the best half of football KU's played since Leipold arrived. And I think you could probably say the probably the most complete game, you know, the, the officiating in the fourth quarter really slowed the game down and changed the game pace a little bit, probably fit Illinois a little bit better, but I just think complete performance. That was, that was good. You know, and yeah, Kansas, I think a lot of encouraging Kansas, stuff. Kansas led K state 31 to nothing in that 08 game. At ha at halftime, yeah. That's so, um, and you know they they were uh, they were running the ball. So I mean, it, it wasn't you know it wasn't one of those things where uh, they they were running the clock a little bit and still you know putting up all those points. So they were putting it on them pretty good. 
Yeah. How, how does this game, so let's go big picture here before we get out of here. How does this game, yeah. the results, how does it change your perspective on the rest of the season? I'm glad you asked the question because it's something we've talked about on this podcast, right? Was we circled this Illinois game and put like five exclamation points after it. And, and I think there was a scenario where Kansas could lose this game and we'd still come away feeling better about Kansas's chances this year. There was a scenario where Kansas could win this game and we'd come away feeling like, uh Oh, you know, something was exposed here. If, if Kansas had lost and Illinois had run for 300 yards and just lined up and, and out tough Kansas, I, I think you'd be sitting here worrying. Neither of those played out. I, I think it, it was, you know, with the way that Kansas came out in the first half and in the second half, you know, we've talked a little bit about the calls and stuff like that. You had what, like five or six reviews, all of which went against Kansas. And I'm not saying all of them erroneously went against Kansas. I'm mm-hmm. just saying it slowed the game to a halt. Obviously, you know, you're feeling like the referees are against you because every single one of these things is going against you. You have, you know, the touchdown that's that's called back for the non-existent block in the back. You have two of your better defenders ejected for targeting. That's a lot of adversity. And you wanted to kind of see how they would respond. And I thought it was interesting, um, Lance Leipold in his interview with Brandon McAnderson, immediately after the game, you know, Brandon, I I think, you know, was, was kind of like, Hey, you know, your guys responded really well. And Leipold had said, I wish we would have responded better uh, type of deal. At the same time, they did make the plays at the end. You know, there wasn't ever a spot where Illinois got it to a one possession game or, or whatever else. And, And so you wanted the defense to come out and make a big play when they got the ball back down, uh, down 11, they make a few plays, get the fourth down and long. And you say, okay, the defense has really stepped up here. They play prevent, allow the long first down. And you say, well, shoot. And then, you know, was it the very next play that they intercepted the pass? Something close to that. It was either the very next play or the play after that. Um, and, and they, they slammed the door shut and, and, to me, would you have liked? Would you have liked that play earlier? Yes. Would you have liked the offense to drive down? You know, after some of that stuff, drive the length of the field, put it in the end zone, and erase all doubt. Yes. But I did think there was a response to adversity. Right. It might not have come as early as you would have wanted it, but it was positive. And all of that's a really long answer to say. I think Kansas won. I mean, I know Kansas won this game, but I think you came out with both outcomes where Kansas won the game and you come out encouraged in that you don't, you feel like Kansas is a really good football team. There's not necessarily a team that worries you as much stylistically because Illinois was able to do something against you. And and so I, I thought it was about as positive an indicator as you could have had. How about you? Yeah, I think it's one of those where it checked the right boxes. Yeah. Where KU was the more physical team, which is the big question going into it. You know, how can Kansas deal with that? Well, they dealt with it pretty darn well. KU's got the quarterback. They've got the offense, the skill position players, but the defense, right? I think that for me was the big key. Again, this is not a great Illinois offense, but just the manner in which they were more physical and dominated that for me is almost a bigger key going into a game maybe against UCF where yeah. UCF is going to have the skilled dudes, but are they going to have the players in the trenches to be able to handle KU? Yeah. Right. Those are some of the things that I think now pop into your head when you're playing this out for the rest of the season. So I think you look now, well, KU should beat Nevada. I think KU will probably be a nine or a 10 point favorite against BYU. If I had to guess, Maybe I'm on the high end there, but I think that's probably what it is. And now you're looking at KU potentially being 4-0 going into Austin as a ranked team. And don't forget, it's the week before Texas goes to goes to Dallas to play Oklahoma. Mm-hmm. And I'm not saying, yeah. you know, I'm, if you're undefeated and ranked, I'm not saying it's a trap game necessarily, but at the same time, 
you know, if you're undefeated and ranked, then, you know, maybe you've got the ability to, to yeah. throw a scare into a Texas team that does have Oklahoma waiting the next week. Yeah, and then they come back home and, and play UCF. I think that'll be another one of these. Li- I think the UCF game for me is another one of these kind of like really fascinating ones because sure. I think the skill guys that UCF has would rival a lot of the top end of the Big 12 just sure. in terms of athletes and the dudes they have, but the trenches. And so I think that'll be another fascinating game. But look, I think there's a very, very r- real possibility that KU starts the season. Um, math is hard. Five and one. Yeah. You know, and I, I still look at that UCF Oklahoma State as as coin flip games still. But yeah. look, if KU starts 4-0, you feel really darn good about them making a bowl game and going past that. You know, I said seven and five before the season, you know, look, I'm not going to tell you that you can't win eight games, right? From what yep. they showed on Friday night, this is a team that can go on and do that. So I think it's, it's a really encouraging performance just because of the manner in which KU did it right. This wasn't a, um, a 52 to 45 shootout where this terrible Illinois offense looks great because KU can't stop anybody. Like, no, Jalen Daniels looked awesome. The offense was awesome. The defense looked great. Like, it's just a complete performance. Yeah, yeah, I I agree. I actually I think that's a pretty good place to uh, to end on because it it was it was a really complete performance. And you know my uh, my kind of answer to my dad when he said you know you came out feeling like they should have won by more was yes, but if somebody would have told you going into the game that Kansas was going to beat Illinois by 11, you would have taken that in a heartbeat. You absolutely would have. And and so to do that, to, to have some teaching tape, as I'm sure Lance Leipold is very excited to have that, that they can go in and and show guys like, Hey, here's some stuff where maybe, maybe we weren't perfect. And maybe some stuff that, that maybe the team needs to clean up a little bit to have some teaching tape, but also have that area that you can point back to and say, Hey, that first half, you know, that that's who we can be. You know, mm-hmm. if, if we put this thing together, I, I think it was really positive. Yep. Totally. So next up is Nevada for KU. That's yep. going to be a Saturday, nine thirty central kick. Um, Oof. I'll be out there. I'm going to go spend a couple of days in Lake Tahoe and, have some fun and then uh, cover the game. So that'll be a fun time, but thank you as uh, always for listening to the fog.net podcast. We will be back with another episode later this week. Make sure if you like what you hear, leave a rating and review on iTunes. That helps us out with the algorithm, getting more people to listen to the show. So if you're liking it, please leave just ratings and reviews on iTunes. Again, go a long way. If you're watching on YouTube, make sure you like the video and you're subscribed to the channel. Obviously, we've got a lot of exclusive YouTube content that we do as well. So thank you as always, Kevin, and we'll talk to you all later this week.